Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you around the world, and thank you for joining uh, joining us this morning. And also thanks to the organizers for this wonderful worldwide seminar that has been running now for quite a while. It has, uh, it's wonderful that we all get to gather and today we'll be gathered here around the world to study elliptic curves. Um, if there's one thing that keeps us together, I think no matter what's happening in the world, it's the love of elliptic curves. I was just uh, talking with uh, a student at the end of our spring term about torsion on elliptic curves. And how do you tell when an elliptic curve has torsion? And one of our favorite things to do is to reduce mod P. So if you start with an elliptic curve over Q and you take a prime P that doesn't divide the discriminant of E, maybe take P greater or equal to 11 to avoid some small prime phenomenon, then whatever the torsion is of your elliptic curve over Q, um, it necessarily embeds in the uh, FP points of your elliptic curve. And so we were playing around and I took this uh, elliptic curve. It looks innocuous enough, I hope. Um, if you're a LMFDB aficionado, you can enter in this label and see all that you would, could ever want to know about this elliptic curve. And what do you get if you count points on this elliptic curve? Modulo a couple of primes. Well, I said I wasn't gonna look at seven, I guess. So we'll start at 11. You start counting, you get 18, 18, 15, 27, 15, 30, and so on. And pretty soon you notice a pattern that all of these point counts are divisible by three. So you might ask yourself, does that necessarily mean that uh, three divides the number of points on, on the, the torsion points of the elliptic curve? It's certainly allowed by the injective map that we wrote down here. Um, and uh, well, the answer is no. No, this in implication need not hold. It's too bad, otherwise this would be a really nice way to uh, detect what the torsion is. If you try for a couple of primes and it looks very often that you have some sort of divisibility statement then you could always be sure that um, this, it's easy to count points over elliptic curve, otherwise it, uh, torsion might be much harder to detect. So what's going on here? Can we fix this some way? Well, there's a theorem of cats that says that if you take um, an elliptic curve E and you have the property that uh, M divides the number of points over FP for all good P. So P doesn't divide the discriminant, maybe take bigger than 11. Then, okay, well, you don't necessarily get E with the property that you're after, but you can always find an isogenous elliptic curve. So isogenous over Q with the property that M divides the number of points on E prime, the torsion subgroup. So why is this the, the right theorem? Well, um, it's a little unfair to ask the poor elliptic curve to have this property about the, its number of points because the number of points is, in its, is an isogeny invariant. If you look at any isogenous elliptic curve, it also has the same number of points. So within the isogeny class over Q, um, it's, not that, uh, it's not obvious that this property of having a torsion of a given order will be preserved. And so it's only fair to really ask on the isogeny class itself. And then the theorem of Katz uh, says that you can always find at least one elliptic curve within that isogeny class with this property. All right, and what happens in the example up above? Well, here's your elliptic curve that is isogenous. It's a little bit bigger, I guess, um, in terms of its coefficients than the one you started with, but it's easy enough to check that uh, this point actually is a, a point of order three. All right, so maybe you stop there. Um, theorems of cats uh, have a tendency of settling important questions, um, but we didn't stop there. We might ask, well, all right, so it, it's not always the case that your elliptic curve has this property that M divides the global torsion subgroup. So you might ask, what were the odds going in that it has this property? So it's kind of a statistical reasoning. So if somebody hands you an elliptic curve and says, wow, I always get three dividing the torsion subgroup, what is the probability that it actually has a global three torsion point? So this is a question that, uh, uh, John Cullinan asked me, so uh, if you have this property that uh, uh, M divides the number of points mod P for all good P greater or equal to 11, what is the probability? Uh, 
that M divides the number of points on E Q tor. So uh, John asked me this question over email and innocently enough, uh, maybe you guess it's 50-50 or maybe you guess 0%. I, I guess at some point I also guessed 100% and maybe it's a number in between. Um, I like this kind of question. It's a, it says whenever you, and maybe this is one of the things I'll offer you for, for your attendance today. Um, yes, Andrew, the isogeny is of degree three. That's, uh, you could almost read that off of the proof of cats itself, but uh, along the way, we will even refine that part of the statement. If you move beyond a prime P and look at something like uh, the 16 divide the order, we will be able to bound the degree of the isogeny. It will always be a power of P, but we'll be even precise, be pre precise about that. All right, so I like this question because it takes something that was, uh, I don't know, a theorem that says you can't guarantee that your elliptic curve has a property, and then you ask the question, all right, well, can you bound or measure the failure of that theorem to hold? So um, it's sort of a, another way that I like this is it's a kind of probabilistic local global principle. So if it looks like your elliptic curve has a three torsion point modulo every prime, what's the probability that it has a three torsion point globally? Um, and uh, that's really a local global principle because you could replace mod P with P attic. Um, the, the, uh, that really is uh, the same thing. Okay, so that's your riddle to, hopefully you're hooked now on the question of sort of understanding and quantifying uh, the properties of elliptic curves. So how are we gonna answer a question like this? Well, first we need to formulate it in a more precise way. So we need to, um, Somehow, there's infinitely many elliptic curves. So to define a probability, we have to order them in some way and then count the ones that have a property that we want. So let's order them by height. So uh, every elliptic curve E over Q is uniquely up to isomorphism over Q to an elliptic curve of the form Y squared equals X Q plus AX plus B. A and B, you can maybe start out as rational numbers, but you clear denominators and you do so in a minimal way. So if you, you have over clear denominators, if you ever have a prime P with the property that P to the fourth divides A and P to the sixth divides B, you can, uh, with the substitution of variables in X and Y, clear that additional power of P, and then you've done so minimally. Of course, all elliptic curves have this property that their discriminant is necessarily non-zero. So, Somehow you could label all elliptic curves uniquely in their isomorphism class by simply a pair of integers, capital A and capital B, satisfying these two properties. That's a way of bookkeeping and keeping track of, of all elliptic curves. And if you do that, it's kind of natural to consider its height to be, I don't know, the largest of the two terms that appear in the discriminant. This is correct by the way in which A and B are weighted in this uh, homogeneous rescaling. Um, and it's natural for, for many other reasons. Um, so uh, we define for an elliptic curve E, maybe we'll, uh, this script E is supposed to de uh, denote uh, the representatives of the isomorphism classes of elliptic curves with these two properties, uh, just to be clear about where, how we're keeping track of them. You can think about them as pairs of integers in a similar way. And then I don't know, all right, so for a, a bound X, we'll take the elliptic curves whose height is at most X and we'll put them into a set. So that'll be, uh, I hope it's clear that there's only finitely many elliptic curves. I bounded A and B in a kind of weighted way. So that's really, uh, you can write them all down. You could even take a uniformly random one by just uniformly choosing A and B in those ranges and then um, uh, accepting it only if it satisfies these two conditions. So you really can uh, get your handle on elliptic curves. There's lots of other ways of ordering elliptic curves by discriminant, conductor, or other properties. They're harder to get at, and this is the right one for the uh, stacky comments that I will make at the end. All right, so with this in mind, we can define a probability. And, oh gosh, this looks uh, kind of weird. Um, we take the elliptic curves with the property that M divides the torsion. That's the probability that we're hoping to um, quantify. And then you, on the bottom, you ask for those that have uh, this property that e, uh, M divides the number of points mod P for all good P. And you take them just up to height X, and then you take the limit as X goes to infinity. So this is the usual, the, this is the total space that you're interested in um, up to height X. 
This is the ones that have the property that you're interested in. And then you define this limit and you hope that it exists. One thing that you restrict to is uh, the integer M should be one where you could even have an elliptic curve with a torsion subgroup of size M. A uh, maser tells you that the list of such M's are just the only ones that are allowed go one up to 10, 12 and 16. All right, so our question is now about, does this probability exist? And if so, what is, the, what is it? You can do computations. And uh, if you count, for example, up to 10 to the 12th, then there's uh, 7,578 elliptic curves, pairs A and B with the property of pairs, and 3,808 of them, uh, sorry, the, but the, you know, we restrict to this set, but then you have to ask for this property that <clears throat> they have, uh, and it looks like they have a three torsion point mod P for every P. And I don't know, it comes out to be about 50.3%. So at least for this uh, initial computation, you might guess that the odds are even. All right, and the first theorem for today is that um, this is joint work with John Cullinan, Megan Kenny, and uh, the theorem <clears throat> and myself. And the theorem is that this probability exists and it's always positive. In fact, um, P3 is a half. We calculated the values, for, so P2 is equal to one, P4 is about 27%, um, and we, we didn't calculate them for all M, but uh, we did show that it is effectively computable and necessarily positive. Okay, so um, great. So how do you prove a theorem like this? Well, there's sort of basically two things you need to do. The first one is to, uh, reduce the problem to counting elliptic curves with a prescribed level structure. So level structure will be, instead of the probability that um, we announced up here, where you ask for a property of the elliptic curve, um, one thing you have to do is to translate, not unlike Andrew's question about uh, what's the nature of the isogeny that holds between E and E prime, but you have to somehow translate this into a question about counting elliptic curves with a certain level structure, image of Galois, and then I'm going to skip that step for reasons of time. I'll invite you to read our paper if you'd like to hear more about it. Um, and I'm gonna to focus today on this question of counting them because it's a nice kind of appealing, analytic, uh, uh, algebraic, uh, arithmetic geometry question that I hope you will find also uh, engaging and interesting. All right, I think this is a good moment for a quick question if somebody has one. By now you should be uh, hooked on counting elliptic curves with certain properties um, and uh, intrigued to hear more. Does anyone have any quick questions? Sure. I have one. Can you tell me what? Please, yes, percentage? I can hear you. Yeah. What's the percentage of elliptic curves counting according <clears throat> to your height versus according to the discriminant, to the conductor? We have not been able to count by discriminant or conductor uh, for the question. I know, and, but because, uh, of your, because of your result, I wonder if that represents, so to speak, uh, the more natural uh, number. I mean, because ordering according to the conductor, if you count the number of points, this is more natural, right? So, 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 In some context, I agree that conductor and discriminant are more natural. Uh, if I have time at the end, I'll make some comments that actually height is the right way to think about this is heights of you count points on a modular curve according to height. And then height is really the right thing if you want to fit it into a program uh, in general of counting points on varieties. So I think it would still be interesting. To, variety, uh, but, um, per, perhaps, but in elliptic curves, you know, number of points is really characterized by the L function. So, but conductor is much more natural, right? Yeah, I think it would be uh, really interesting to compare this result and to try to prove something there. I expect it will be harder. For example, even just uh, counting elliptic curves ordered by conductor is already without any question about- yeah, yeah, I agree, I, I realize, so, but, but what's your expectation? Is that percentage in your theorem, um, would be the same one half 
I mean, if you uh, just guess, of course, you said it is difficult. I, I'm not asking that, but just, just what would be your, your guess? I guess that this theorem should be pretty stable, that it should exist and it should still be positive, but I don't think that it will be exactly a half anymore. Yeah, okay. The, the probabilities should change a bit. So there's a, a hand raised. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Jun -Hyuk -Jun. Um, I was just wondering if uh, Kat's theorem uh, would already tell you that PM has to be greater than or equal to one over eight, because uh, because isogeny classes, uh, there is at most like eight, eight, eight elliptic curves in the same isogeny class class. And uh, it's not clear to me that it does because you don't know the heights of the elliptic curves in that isogeny class. Oh, so I maybe see. the one so, that has a, a torsion point is gargantuanly larger than the other. And as you go farther, they become rare and rare. We shouldn't expect that. But I think your intuition is right that it should suggest a positive probability, but you have to prove something. Okay, thanks. And a, a question from Ariel Weiss in the chat. I'll just read it. At least when P is greater than three, shouldn't the probability ordering by conductor just be 50% in a five isogeny class where one has five torsion, the other will not? Um, I guess. Uh, Conductor is invariant under the isogeny class. Um, so you would need to know that when you have an elliptic curve with this property that five divides the order, but you want to check globally that that is the isogeny class that you're talking about is just the pair of two. I think that is uh, the most likely scenario. And I yeah, wonder it, what it, it, it sounds just good follows to me. from like, it just follows from like classic Ribet's lemma that you have two distinct characters, one of them on the diagonal of the Gower representation, one is trivial and one is cyclotomic. So one isogeny class of sub will be trivial and the other isogeny class of sub will be cyclotomic, so it doesn't have torsion. Yeah, that sounds nice. I wonder what happens if you take 16, for example, if uh, you'll have to investigate a more complicated isogeny class, and it doesn't address the question about discriminants. That, that's really probably harder. Thanks, Ariel. All right, I better get keep going here. Um, so uh, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up a general problem about counting elliptic curves with level structure. So in order to do that, I need to talk about torsion points on elliptic curve and how the absolute Galois group acts on them. So I'll do this, hopefully uh, set up notation in an efficient way. So there's the absolute Galois group of Q. This is my uh, algebraic closure of Q. It acts on the M torsion of the elliptic curve. Um, it's uh, Q bar points. Um, as an abelian group, it is isomorphic to Z mod MZ. The Galois group moves them around. So that gives you a representation depending on E and M uh, from the Galois group into GL2 Z mod MZ. It acts by change of basis. So, um, and it's the main example to keep in mind here is uh, if you take, if the image is contained inside the subgroup, I don't know, one star, zero star, uh, what Ariel was saying is that the determinant of this representation is necessarily the cyclotomic character. So here you even know what the star is. Um, you have an image, this holds if and only if uh, EQ has a point of order M. This is uh, up to a choice of basis. So when we write down um, two by two matrices representing the action. Uh, in this isomorphism, I've chosen a basis of them. So I don't know if this thing is like generated by P1 and P2, uh, then in this case, the point of order M is the point P1. And if I choose a different basis, then I will have conjugated the subgroup. Um, so in order to have this notation, then I wanna consider the image contained inside this up to conjugation, I'll write it like this. Instead of a less than or equal to, I'll write it with the less than and then a tilde, to indicate that it is up to a choice of basis. I hope that's okay. And I hope it's clear that uh, when Galois acts like this on P1, it's really leaving the point P1 where it is. That's what it means to have, uh, to be a fixed vector under the action. And by Galois theory, that says that you have a rational M torsion point. 
So we want to study things like this property and whatever other images of Galois you get from conjugate subgroups from being isogenous to such an elliptic curve. I'm going to focus on fixing the group G and asking um, how many elliptic curves have Galois image contained inside a fixed subgroup. So how do we write down something like that? Well, I guess we'll switch from little n to capital N, which is more common in this world. So you take a, a non-negative integer n and you choose a subgroup G and GL2, Z mod NZ, which we only care about up to conjugation. And then we ask that the determinant of G is fully Z mod NZ cross. This is the cyclotomic character and it's a necessary condition. If you have an elliptic curve over Q, um, it ne any image of Galois G has to have the property that it's determinant of surjective because you don't uh, have uh, non-trivial words of unity in Q. All right, so then the first uh, thing that we need to do is to count, a, in order to count such elliptic curves, how do we do it? Well, there's a, an open modular curve. I don't care about generalized elliptic curves right now. And well, it's doing everything it can to parameterize the elliptic curves E over Q with a property that it's mod N Galois representation, um, the image of Galois here. Uh, is contained up to conjugation in G, the fixed subgroup that I took in GL2, Z mod NZ. And if you want the precise description, it goes like this. Um, you take your group G, you intersect it with SL2, and then you pull back under the natural surjective map from SL2Z. You define a group called gamma G, and then the group, um, the curve that you want to write down, YG, is the quotient of the upper half plane um, by this group. So that's the recipe. Um, this isn't a talk on elliptic curves and their Galois representation. So that's all I have time to say right now, but I hope you'll agree that this is something that um, is uh, easy or effective to understand. Um, the example that we had up above where you take G to be this one zero star star group, uh, then this gamma G is just our usual friend gamma one of N. If you're upper triangular modulo N, that's exactly the condition that we wrote down. And then moreover, you want the upper entry to be uh, one. And so this YG that I wrote down is just the open modular familiar curve Y one of N. Actually, there's some quite some work in the LMFDB to try to catalog all of the possible modular curves. So just if you clicked on Drew's link to get to know the elliptic curve. I bet you have this uncontrollable urge also to click on classical modular curves to get to know them better. Um, that should be coming to an LMFDB near you. Now there's lots of work in finding rational points on modular curves. And that's, you know, of high genus in order to see exotic things that are happening. That's also not the topic of today, though we're waving at it as we go by. We want situations where the modular curves have genus zero so that we can have infinitely many points to count. Um, if there's only, if it's genus greater or equal to two, Faulting says there's only finitely many and then there's no point in doing asymptotics. If it's genus one, well, that's sort of, a, there'll be logarithmically many at most, uh, depending on the rank. And that's also uh, not really the fundamental question that we're asking about. We wanna look at the cases of genus zero. As it turns out, there's really only finitely many up to twists. So uh, we have kind of a, a finite concrete task in front of us. All right, so with that notation, um, here is the quantity that we would like to investigate. So it depends on my group G, which is a subgroup of GL uh, to Z mod NZ. I choose my parameter X, and then I say, hello, elliptic curves. Um, I look at you that have height at most X, and then I say, when is the image of your Galois representation contained inside my group G up to conjugation? And I want to count this as a function of X. All right. So the, uh, the first sort of systematic uh, attempt to understand these according to height was work of Heron and Snowden. And we have a more general theorem, which I guess I will just show to you. Um, so this will be our, our first main theorem for the talk today. Continuing, it's how, it's the main ingredient for our probability theorem. So again, it's joint work with John and Megan. So we have somewhat strong hypotheses. So let me go through those first, but the answer will be an asymptotic for this function ng of x, enough to count our probabilities. So we ask the very strong condition that this group gamma g is torsion free. So it also doesn't have minus one in it. 
So uh, there's no elements of finite order in the group um, gamma G that we took upstairs other than the identity element. There's a condition here about no irregular cusps, but I hope you'll just ignore it. It's just a, a silly technical thing that only shows up for gamma one of four and you really should. I mean, I have to put it there because I want my theorem to be true, but it, it is not relevant for understanding. And then I do, I make this uh, less severe constraint that YG has G to zero in the sense that that's what we're interested in anyway in, in counting points on. So then I define an integer which is called DG and it's half the index of gamma G inside SL2Z. This really is an integer because I asked that minus one is not in the group. So gamma G projects into PSL2Z and that's why it's uh, necessarily uh, always an even index. Uh, this is always even, so I can divide by two. You can interpret this as some kind of reduced degree of the J map, if you wanted to think about it that way on the set of elliptic curves, which feels like the natural measure for how complicated these elliptic curves are getting. All right, and our theorem is there exists an effectively computable constant CG. It might be zero. It might be the case that your uh, YG is a genus zero curve, but it doesn't have any rational points, in which case there's no problem counting points on that. If there's no points at all, the answer is zero, but then uh, the statement still needs to be true. So I, uh, there is a, a possible quaternion algebra or a conic that might show up that has no rational points. Thank God I got to say quaternion algebras at some point in this talk. All right, and our answer is that this uh, uh, ng of x is asymptotic to x to the one over dg, and the error term is one over two dg. So it is like a square root error term, which is uh, pretty strong uh, given the nature of general asymptotics, but uh, that's what we were able to prove as x goes to infinity. All right, did that make sense? Hope so. Um, and uh, this is enough to prove our probability exists and is non-zero. Um, you look at the modular curves that I haven't told you about, but which are described in the paper. They, they're finitely many. You see what these main terms are with the D of G. They all have the same D and the constants are all non-zero. So basically the numerator and the denominator are both the same order of magnitude with non-zero probabilities and therefore the probability exists and is non-zero. That's how we prove our, our theorem. And uh, well, what Heron and Snowden made significant progress on this, but they only proved statements of the form um, X one over DG is less than less than this quantity NGX is less than less than X to the one over uh, DG. So they got the, that isn't even an asymptotic. It's just like telling you the uh, estimate on the rate of growth, the less and less than is there exists a constant. Now notice that wouldn't be enough for our results because you would want to take the ratio of these two things on top and bottom. And because you don't have convergence on anything, it doesn't actually tell you what the probability is. So um, there are a lot of interesting results in counting elliptic curves with certain properties, but um, I guess I'm going to ask us to imagine and hope for whenever we can uh, effectively computable constant out in front um, uh, with an asymptotic and a power saving error term. Um, this power saving error term in the language of probability would tell us about the convergence to the probability. You know, what are our odds um, if you fix a value of X? And so um, uh, that's, that'll be our gold standard for, for um, trying to address those. All right, so this does apply to the cases that you are probably most interested in, namely torsion groups themselves. So let me show you that even though I've, I've dropped the probability uh, statement. So um, this would ask for elliptic curves where the uh, torsion subgroup is isomorphic to a given group T. So it applies in all but uh, the first few cases which you can do separately. And uh, here's the table that you get. I tried to have nice handwriting, but as I was writing this out, I, I decided just to copy the table in so you could really see some crisp fonts there. Um, and uh, here's where, if you have, if you just look at all possible elliptic curves, the number of them is x to the five six. Uh, that makes sense because a cubed is bounded, b squared is bounded. That gives you x to the one third and one half. Those totals give you x to the five six. And the error term here is a, is a half that comes naturally from that. Um, I guess for the three torsion that we were looking at earlier, 
Um, this is the main contribution to the term. These would be our, our friendly numerator terms where you have, uh, so they grow like x to one third with a one fourth. It's kind of interesting to see when these numbers coincide, like at five and six torsion occur with the same probability as uh, Z2 cross Z4. Um, that's just how the numbers work out in terms of degrees. And uh, anyway, this is some kind of quantification of uh, when you look at elliptic curves, what kinds of torsion subgroups should you expect with what kind of probability? They're all very sparse, um, so they'll be 0%, but at least here you're quantifying the rate of growth as you uh, increase the height. Okay, so I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, generalizations and related and preceding work. So I've already mentioned the heron snowden result. Uh, Brumer and Duke considered questions like this, uh, also trying to under make the conjectures about ordering elliptic curves by conductor and height. That's just about this line here. Um, and then more recently, uh, Peter Brown and, and uh, Phil Najman and Cho and Jung and Phillips, uh, Tristan Phillips uh, had some recent papers on the archive, a PhD student in Arizona, are also working on this, uh, thinking about elliptic curves over number fields. And I'll have some more references uh, later on. This is a really active, interesting area with lots of questions popping out. Um, and uh, sorry, I don't have time to cover all of them. I'll just try to give you my perspective on them and sort of how, how, uh, how we might aim for a general result. All right. Um, good so far. Everybody still with me? So I think, oh, good, a question. What goes into the effectively computable constant? What a wonderful question. I think you will have a great answer once I get into the steps of the proof. So I'm going to use that as a motivation to uh, show you how the proof works, because um, you really can describe what the constants are. All right, so it works in four steps. So I put things in red here if because uh, well, I announced that we should really try to find an asymptotic for ng of x for general g. And that would, you know, with the power saying error term and effectively computable constant. So that's what we would like to get to. Our, our theorem had some hypotheses in it. And so if the hypotheses are sort of hard to remove, um, I put something in red, right? There's a technical issue that arises there. And if it's see, it works out pretty much the same when we remove those hypotheses, I put a blue. So blue is supposed to be a friendly color and red is where we're gonna have to do some work in about uh, 10 minutes. All right, so the first thing you do, which is kind of standard, is to produce a universal curve. Okay, so what does it mean? So there's just a, um, here I have an example for number one, just to show you what it looks like, so I don't have to go into great detail. There's more or less an algorithm now, which, is implemented in magma and probably also some formulation in SAGE, and you can even do some of them by hand. It's called the Tate normal form. If you wanted to write down the universal elliptic curve or all elliptic curves with a five torsion point, what do you do? Well, you change coordinates to make that five torsion point be at zero, zero, and then you take uh, triple the point and compare it to double the point, and you ask that those have the same x coordinate, and that gives you a natural parameterization on the coefficients. So what you will find in general are polynomials A of AB and B of AB, which come from the homogenizations of some polynomials in one variable. T would be the parameter on your genus zero modular curve. And these would be the values of the Eisenstein series written as rational functions or cleared through homogeneously um, in terms of that, uh, what's called a Haupt module. And the A over B is just comes about from writing the fraction T in terms of numerator denominator and then writing them hom homogeneously. So this is what you would get for Y105. And the theorem is that every elliptic curve with a five torsion point comes about via some T equals A over B in this way. So you can write down exactly those. There's a little bit extra structure here, namely that uh, this is elliptic curve equipped with a five torsion point. So that is handled in our point four. All right, so once you have an elliptic curve, um, what do you do? Well, you do something which is called apply the principle of Lipschitz, which is also Davenport's lemma. Um, I'll have a few words on that, but what, now what you need to do is to take this A of AB and B of AB and imagine plugging in integers A and B, asking for these quantities to be bounded. So now you have a bunch of, uh, I don't know, we'll call it lattice points in a region where you need to count them with some explicit inequalities. And that's a more or less standard thing in, in analytic number theory. I'll show you that in just a second. You, then you have to sieve afterwards. Um, you've done some overcounting. There were the conditions that uh, 
P to the fourth and P to the sixth do not divide A and B respectively. So you have to treat those conditions. And I call this first you groom them. And then there's something else that occurs, which is you have to avoid um, something called the minimality defect at certain finitely many primes. Uh, and finally, account for automorphisms, which is overcounting. If you just want to count the elliptic curves, not elliptic curves equipped with something, um, and maybe that, that's uh, asking for multiple values of these polynomials that come about from the same value of t. That's a relatively easy step, but also itself interesting. All right, so that's the basic strategy. I hope that makes sense. Um, to show you what the constant looks like, um, it comes from the area of the region and this sieving, which will introduce a zeta factor. So I'm going to show you what that looks like in an example. Um, so here is the principle of Lipschitz. So uh, in general, uh, if you have a bounded region defined by nice inequalities in, uh, in R to the n, and you want to count the number of lattice points, here we'll just have two-dimensional regions. So I'll do a slightly easier one. So how would you estimate the number of points in a region like this? Well, you would estimate it as being approximately the area of the region, whatever this region is. And uh, that makes sense because if you put a little square over each part of the region, that should do a pretty good job of estimating uh, the number of lattice points there. What could go wrong? What would the error term be related to? Well, it's sort of near the boundary. Um, if those squares don't exactly line up with the region, you should be expecting an error term, which is as complicated as the boundary of the region. And so uh, the principle of Lipschitz, which is also called Davenport's lemma, says that the error term exactly the length of the boundary. For which you could take the maximum of the projections onto the coordinate axes. That, that would be another way of thinking about it. So if we write this out, so if I have a region R and I want to count the number of lattice points in the region, that should be the area of the region together with the length of the boundary. Okay, so how would you count elliptic curves? Um, well, we have some kind of homogeneously expanding regions with A's and B's. So if you, uh, if you want to count just uh, elliptic curves without any extra conditions, you would be counting something like pairs a b where 4a cubed and 27b squared are less than or equal to x so how would you count something like that well i have an a b plane over here um, and what i want to do is to make the region that uh, encapsulate those lattice points and then the height here will be something like a goes up to uh, x over 27 to the half and the b goes up to uh, x over four to the one third. And you have to double those, I guess. Um, and so the area of the region is just gonna be four times these quantities, so it's one third, one over 27. And then it's x to the five six. That's the area when you multiply these two quantities together and the area of the length, which is the error term is the x to the one half. So hopefully I've just given you now the explanation for what the exponents are, both in the main term and the error term. They come from the description of the area of the region and its homogeneously expanding uh, description. Um, and uh, that's the first answer to Jacob to your question, what is the constant represent? It represents the, the area of the region where you take you know, R of one. So you take some fixed region and then it homogeneously expands. We're not done yet because we have to sieve. So in the sieving step, we've overcounted. How many do we need to remove? Well, we need to remove any A pair, A and B, where a prime P to the fourth divides A and a prime P to the sixth divides B. That's sort of uh, one out of every P to the minus 10. So we need to multiply by a one minus a P to the minus 10 uh, over all primes P. We also have to remove the a and b where 4a cubed plus 27b squared is equal to zero, but that term truly is negligible. Um, and what you get from this, I hope you guys recognize the zeta factor here, it's zeta of 10. So the number of elliptic curves, not with any, without any torsion subgroup um, is given by this quantity. You arrange your constants, you have a term down here, zeta 10, x to the five six plus big O of x to the one over one half. So I hope I answer your question, Jacob. 
all of our uh, constants should look like this. There's an area term and then a term that comes from sieving together with, in this case, no extra weirdness with minimality defects at finite many primes. But if you ask for like M torsion subgroups at primes dividing M, there's also kind of local factors that show up there. Um, and in general, what you'll have to do is to take polynomials like these, these A and B, and you'll have a different kind of more complicated region, but still you'll have the same kind of general strategy for, for proof. Okay, great. So um, good, a, a moment to pause for just a minute to, to make sure that I'm still reaching you. So now I've basically told you how we prove our, our main result. I'll review the steps here. Um, there was a more or less standard computational thing. We just write down all the universal curves. We really do need to get those in the LMFDB, you guys. That's, uh, that's really essential when we, when we do that part. Um, the principle of Lipschitz tells us about a homogeneous expanding region. We end up counting lattice points, and that's uh, relatively standard. So the hard part will be, um, boy, what happens when you don't have a universal curve? There's some technicalities introduced there. Um, and then there's really problems in sieving, especially with this minimality defect when we start to peel away our hypotheses. So now I'd like to uh, try to imagine what a general result would look like. So can we get an asymptotic with power saving error terms for the functions ng of x for an arbitrary g of g of zero. So what were the hypotheses that I need to delete? Um, the hypotheses are, okay, well, I guess I already in advance deleted the no irregular cusp, but okay, I guess uh, um, there, that's not, a, that's, that remains a technicality that isn't interesting. So it's really this torsion free that we have to worry about. So um, the reason why, uh, modular curves where the gamma G is torsion free is great is because they really are a fine moduli space. There really are universal polynomials. There's no stacky weirdness that, that happens. But as soon as you uh, remove this hypothesis, for example, if minus one is in the group, um, then any elliptic curve with the image contained in G will it also all of its quadratic twists will also have the same, the same property. So you really have to count in a different way. So on the way to a general result, maybe we should, should keep some uh, cases in mind. Um, so uh, maybe the most, the next most natural thing you might want to count are elliptic curves with a cyclic N isogeny defined over Q. So the difference here is the point itself, its X and Y coordinates are not necessarily defined over Q anymore. You just ask for a subgroup of order N, which is stable under the Galois action. So that changes your upper triangular matrix with a one here. Now you just ask that that element maps within that cyclic subgroup. The associated open modular curve is now called Y naught of N instead of Y one of N. And I hope you'll agree that uh, if this program is to succeed, these are emblematic of the kinds of uh, elliptic curves we should be counting. And if you have an elliptic curve with a cyclic N isogeny, so too will every quadratic twist. So minus one is in the group and you really are not in the nice case that we already dealt with. You genuinely run into new and interesting obstacles. All right, so um, I have uh, two more theorems to show you. Um, here's the next theorem, which represents uh, uh, the desiderata that I announced in sort of the first interesting case where you look at three isogenies. So if you have a if you have a two isogeny, you just have a point in a non-trivial point that's basically not harder than two torsion points themselves. So if you ask for three torsion points, I, I decorated this and called it G0 of three for the group. So this is counting elliptic curves that have a rational three isogeny. And this is joined with Maggie Pizzo, Carl Pomerantz, with and Carl Pomerantz. And the statement of the theorem really does look quite different than the one that we had earlier. Um, it starts out with an x to the one half term, which is kind of crazy. Um, this corresponds just to the curves with a is equal to zero. Okay, that's equivalent to saying that the j is equal to zero. Um, so these are all curves of the form y squared equals x u plus b for some value of b. So b squared is supposed to be less than or equal to x. And that's why you get already x to the one half as many elliptic curves. And this constant is no harder than the one we just wrote down uh, looking at elements in a square. Okay, and this is really weird that uh, sort of one elliptic curve and its twist already account for. So if you ran up to elliptic curve on the street with the three isogeny, 
uh, with all of them that you run into are going to have j equals zero for, for whatever reason. Um, if you uh, are, all right, and then after that, I don't know, there are effectively computable constants c, and now there's a c prime depending on this the group g zero three that have well now there's a log term and then a term just below it, and still we have a, a power saving error term. So um, I think each of these terms will have some meaning when we go down below. I would say this x to the one third is that that one third is the same as the third that we looked at when we did uh, three torsion points. And the reason for the log is because of this quadratic twist. It's like a Dirichlet divisor problem. If you have are familiar with that aspect of analytic number theory, it introduced uh, sort of divisors um, up to a given point. And that's why you have both an x to the one third with a log x. Um, I don't know that I've ever proven a theorem with like a, not just a secondary term, but a tertiary term and a power saving error term after that. But that's what you get uh, when you write a paper with Carl Pomerantz. Um, you really get uh, top quality results. Now, Carl and I and Maggie, we did not prove this theorem using the principle of Lipschitz because we didn't find a way to make it work. Instead, we just considered the problem on its face. Um, you want the three division polynomial, which is a quartic polynomial to have a root. And we just got to town sort of uh, proving what we could. Uh, I wanted this to give us some momentum, some, some tailwind to launch the general project of the NGs. And this was the first non-trivial you know non -trivial case where you could actually do something. Um, since this paper, uh, there's been lots of further work trying to address these questions in varying kinds of level of generality. The field K could be an arbitrary number field or even global field. Um, so Brandon, Bogus, and Sumiyar Sankar have some results of the uh, analogous to the Heron Snowden results with an asymptotic with a less than less than. Uh, Tristan has also been working really hard to generalize in certain cases. Uh, Carl and Ed Schaefer did some results with four isogenies and more than one four isogeny. So again, there's lots of, there, there's probably other ongoing work as we speak um, to try to address these, these kinds of questions now that we've seen that it is possible. And I have one final theorem to announce, one that I'm very happy to share with you today. It's sort of emblematic of what I think will be a general result. So this is joint work with my uh, PhD student, Grant Molnar, um, who will be on the job market next year. And we prove this is the count for seven isogenies. Um, so there was, it stood out as a, a case that was not, that could not be addressed using the general framework. All of the issue was in sieving in that step three that I announced. And we got, we managed to get the sieve to work. I'll have more comments on that below. But anyway, the result is similar. There's no uh, weird term out in front here. There's just the x to the one six log x and x to the one six. These constants are effectively computable. And in fact, we have them to the first few decimal digits and we get a nice power saving error term. And maybe with a bit more time, uh, we can improve on this 745, but that definitely is of the shape that would be desired for all, all of the possible cases. So we do expect that this will allow us to address our strategy to address basically all of the remaining genus zero curves using again the principle of shifts. We have a way to approach the sieve. And uh, here is the new idea. We count elliptic curves, not up to isomorphism over Q, but in this case where it's well-defined on the twist class, it's naturally to define them sort of minimally within that twist class. So the green, the lowercase green here is sort of up to isomorphism over the algebraic number. So that is up to twist. So if you avoid the usual uh, candidates, j equals zero and 70, 28, uh, instead of asking for the condition above where you have a four and a six, you ask uh, not up to isomorphism over Q, but up to over the algebraic closure. Now you ask for no prime P such that P squared divides A and P cubed divides A. And then up to the twist by minus one, there is exactly two elliptic curves that are minimal in their twist class. And then we're gonna count those. I hope that seems natural. If I can count those, then I can further twist um, to count all of the uh, all of them up to isomorphism over Q. And this may be a separately interesting question. If you have a problem that's well defined um, on the twist class, maybe you want to choose a minimal representative in that twist class, just like we chose a minimal representative of the elliptic curve, and then count them this way. So, uh, how do you formalize that? Well, our uh, technique is to form the Dirichlet series, where you 
have the coefficients given by your elliptic curve where their twist height, uh, which is uh, uh, what I just defined, is of a given n. Uh, the Dirichlet series encodes the asymptotic if you want to count the number of such up to x. And then if you want to put in the twists, there's a, a Landau's version of the Tauberian theorem. This also goes by the phrase melon peron heuristics. So all you have to do is to add in the twists, which is to multiply by certain zeta factors. Of course, you wonder if you have a power saving error term, um, you understand the pole uh, of this uh, L function with a given, uh, with a bit of room. And then you understand the analytic properties of this ratio of zeta functions. And that's, uh, that's all you need in order to finish the asymptotic to understand the sieves. So that's all the time I have to say about that theorem. Um, I promised some stacky comments, uh, but I'm only going to say this in, in 30 seconds. So there's it's sort of my main motivation, which is uh, recent work of uh, Jordan Ellenberg, Matt Satriano, and David Zarek Brown. They define a notion of height for rational points on stacks, and they formulate a conjecture of, well, they call it bad man type, but Batirif Manin Mala type. And this is for the number of points of height up to x. This should be a general gadget which uh, allows us that should make predictions of a wide generality in arithmetic statistics. So within this framework, we have a stacky curve, the modular curve, um, and our n g of x is really counting points on this y of g. So. Um, the exponent that occurs in our theorems really matches the Fujita invariant that they define in generality. So you could see all of our work on the ng of x as being uh, uh, proofs of the predictions that they make of this general conjecture about stacky points. So that's why I'm less interested in discriminants and conductors and more interested in, in heights. All right, well, uh, the final takeaway, if you have an elliptic over the rationals and it looks like it has the three torsion point when you reduce mod p, the odds are 50-50 that it does. And uh, in general, uh, I've shown you a couple of theorems of which we hope to have the most general one, at least over q. If you have modular curves with genus zero, there's an asymptotic with power saving error term for the number of rational points by height. So if you, if you found this uh, an appealing subject, um, I hope that you will join us for a math research community Explicit computations with stacks. You're really counting points on a stack, but you're doing so really with your bare hands, uh, trying to understand some explicit arithmetic functions. So we're organizing an MRC, uh, Andrew Coben, Sumia Sankar, Libby Taylor, David Zerg Brown, and we would love to have you um, if you would like to join us in solving some of these problems. Thank you very much for your attention.